Shalom. Shalom. We have a lot to we have a lot to work on. I want to enter Moren Evochim theology um, through three different doors. And therefore this lecture will be divided into three parts. After every part we'll have a small round of questions and then we'll continue. I want us to discuss the structure of the God for the perplexed. I want to discuss the tension that the God of the perplexed is trying to solve. And finally, what Hartman calls the philosophic quest of Maimonides, finally after I establish what's the tension that the God is trying to solve, I'll try to introduce my understanding of what is the tension that the God is trying to create. I hope you had time to read also the introduction to the guide, did you? The introduction, there was a lot of reading material I know. I want to start with some thoughts about the introduction to the guide. It's my understanding that Rambam introduces himself and thinks about his book as the inheritor of the Talmudic tradition of how do you transmit the noble knowledge called the Sedot Torah, Maaseh Bereshit, Maaseh Merkava. How is that knowledge, the noble knowledge? How are you supposed to share that knowledge? And in our tradition, tradition, the more noble the knowledge is, so the more there are restrictions on how you share that knowledge. Well, you can't share that knowledge with just any person. The student of this kind of knowledge needs to be trying to figure this out. Knowledge is, this is how that knowledge is shared. It turns the students from passive listeners into what? Active learners. They are participating in creating the knowledge. Which means, by the way, that Western tradition of learning, like this, by the way, when there's a teacher and passive students and you just talk and people listen, that's not the Talmudic understanding of learning. Students are active. Students, I think that's why, that's why in Hartman we do chavuta. Students are active. You're supposed to continue with your own mind and understand what Rambam not, is not saying. It's born out of what he is saying. That's how he's trying to conceal secret. But that's not enough. There's a second. And that is, he writes, that the Rashi Prakim, those beginnings of knowledge, of bodies of knowledge, units of knowledge, are not organized. He says that they are scattered all over the book. It's a very not organized book. If you read the guide, you realize how unorganized it is. Probably that prophecy, that is prophecy in volume two. But there's some chapters or paragraphs of prophecy in volume two and volume one, all scattered. It's not organized. Chaos. It's almost like this book had a terrible editor. There's only one problem, so we could we could write this off. Yeah, the reason why the guide is not organized, Rambam wasn't good in organizing knowledge. There's only one problem. If there's anyone in the history of Jewish tradition that we can say that's not and that doesn't that master the art of organizing knowledge is the writer of Mishneh Torah. The person who took the Talmudic chaos and organized it in the fashion which is so impressive, it just um, shut that. The organizer of Mishneh Torah a not organized book called Mishneh Probably not. That we should believe him when he writes that the chaos is very organized. 
but it's deliberate. And the writer of Bolin is sorry, the reader of Bolin is needs to take as Ramban, follow Maimonides' advice, parts of the Shiva, put them back. Since he's going translated, the Hashiv Elu. Which means that the reader of Moran de Mochim is not only also the writer of Moran de Mochim, he is also the editor of Moran de Mochim. But let's say we did both of that. We managed to organize the knowledge all over again. And he managed to figure out the end of the chapter from the beginning of the chapter. There's still a hidden secret. And there's the most radical move in the introduction to the gospel. Says that he deliberately contradicts himself. Where contradictions are by scholars, not only by scholars, he writes this from the Hasuga Shvi, from the um, seventh cat. He puts all different contradictions in seven categories, and the seventh category is a category understood by his great disciple Rabbi Avraham Abulafia, playing with creating. A game with words that only Hebrew can create, says Abu Lafia, hastirot yesh starim. In English, that just doesn't work. hastirot yesh starim. Behind the contradiction is hiding a secret. Meaning, if you could uncover the contradiction and then decode the contradiction, you'll find the hidden secret. Now you're touching the secrets that the Rambam planted in the bottom of his book. But that's not enough. Towards the end of the introduction, he does something that not many people have done before. How do you say that in English? He's forcing his, his reader to to take an oath. To swear. To swear? Yeah. And the shvua that he imposes on the reader is the following. If you uncover the secrets to the guide, to his book, you're under oath now. You're not allowed to share it with anyone else. Which means if you manage to uncover the entire chapters from beginning of chapters and, and put all the chapters together, and discover the contradictions and solve the contradictions and touch the hidden secret he planted in the bottom of his book, you can't share it with anyone else. It's only yours. It's my understanding that Maimonides did that because he try, he's trying to follow the famous Mishnah from Chagiga that says they are supposed to teach the secrets only to one student and not to many. And he's trying to create the following reality. If people would actually take that oath seriously, which no one has ever, no one ever did, people would actually take that oath seriously, so you wouldn't have ever had books written about Moren Nebuchim, and never courses delivered about Moren Nebuchim, and never lectures delivered about Moren Nebuchim. Every lecture delivered about Moren Nebuchim is a violation of the oath of Moren Nebuchim. Meaning, if anybody here wants to take the Rambam at least remotely seriously, I think this is a good opportunity to leave the room. <laughs> but everybody's staying. And the truth is, for about 800 years, everybody stayed. Books about the secrets of the guide were written, and classically, Ibn Kaspi, Narboni, the classic interpreters of the guide, always opened the book trying to explain why is it that they're violating the shvua. And there's halachic, mu okay, it's very funny, halachic attempts, showing that the shvua is not halachically, how do you say takif? Valid. Because for shvua to be valid, you have to have the consent, of, as if Rambam thought it was halachic. I think what Rambam tried to do, he tried to create a reality where you don't teach about Moren you don't listen to classes about Moren Nebuchim, you don't read books about Moren Nebuchim. If you want to know something about Moren Nebuchim, it has to be one on one, you and Moren Nebuchim with no mediation. That's the reality he failed to create. But he wanted it to be one on one. Because the tradition is that you teach the great secrets only to one student. Oh, and finally, 
the entire book is not even a book. The way he organizes it is as a letter. It's a letter to someone else, not to you. To who? To Rabbi Yosef bin Rabbi Yudah, a great disciple. Now, why is it organized as a letter, as one very big, long letter? I think, one, because he's trying to say how the reader of the God is supposed to look like has to be someone like Rabbi Yosef bin Rabbi Yudah. But I think he's trying to achieve something else, a great psychological effect. He's trying to make sure that when we read his book, it feels like we're peeking into someone else's mail. It's not really for us. There's some sense of guilt <laughs> he's trying to inject in the, re in the readers of the guide of the perplexed. What is the book about? This book that constantly is trying to hide its own message using those three methods of hiding that I've tried to explain. What is this book about? Well, this book is a, is a, is a radical attempt to rationalize Judaism trying to explain everything. You read chapter one in Mishnah Torah. There he tries to prove that God exists. He offers three more attempts to prove that God exists in the opening to volume two of the God of the Perplex, this being one of them. Besides proving rationally that God exists, he tries to make sense out of prophecy and out of providence. Everything, according to Rambam, is explainable. Everything is transparent to our intellect. And yes, there is a tradition, a Talmudic tradition, that parts of the Torah aren't supposed to be transparent. How does the Talmud call the mitzvot that we're not, we're not supposed to understand, that we can't understand? How does the Torah call that part of the Torah? As opposed to mishpatim, which we're supposed to be able to understand, there is the chukim. Like paraduma shatnez which we can't understand even if we try. And that observation of Chukim and Mishpatim, that there's parts of the Torah that are intelligible and parts that are deliberately unintelligible, was inherited, that observation, that distinction, was inherited by Rav Sa'ad Yagaon, and he renames it Mitzvot, Shim Iyot. They're supposed to listen to them, not understand them, and Mitzvot, Sich Liot. Rambam goes against that distinction. According to Rambam, all the mitzvot are sikhliyot. He devotes 25 chapters in the Guide of the Perplexed from volume 225 to volume 250, sorry, 325 to 350 to try to uncover, do the best he can to uncover the hidden meaning of all the mitzvot. So he asks, so what is the meaning of that famous Talmudic distinction, chukim and mishpatim? So Rambam says, distinction does mean something, and here is the meaning. Chukim, Mishpatim are the mitzvot that are easy to understand. Chukim are the mitzvot that are harder to understand. That's the distinction. That is midrash on the Talmudic midrash. And Rambam knows that this big project of rationalizing Judaism, making everything transparent, he knows he's going to be criticized for this. And he writes why, and this is something I learned from David. He writes why, he knows why he's going to be criticized for this great project. And he's going to be criticized because people need a sense of mystery, and he's robbing Judaism from its mystery. And here's what he, he, he writes in the third part, in part three, chapter 34. He says, if I tapped into that correctly, he says, that the reason why people think that giving te'amim, giving meaning, the rationale to the mitzvot, it minimizes the significance of those mitzvot is because of a disease that they have in their souls. Meaning if anyone doesn't agree with them, he must, have, he must be mentally ill. In, in Hebrew, the translation is choli shematsuhu benafsham. What is the disease that they have in their soul, that are in their mind that if you understand something, it's less meaningful? It's the understanding that something, only if I don't understand it, if there's a sense of mystery attached to it, does it have religious significance? That's a very 
important religious impulse that Rambam is going against. We try to understand this. Umberto Eco writes that people have religious experience, that people have religious moments when they visit foreign cultures. Because only when you're in a foreign place, the mystique, the sense of mystery is triggered. This is a great observation of Eco that explains Rambam's observation of why people are going to hate what he does. I remember when I understood, the first time I understood this was in my first week in the Israeli army. Now there's something interesting in the army. If you misbehave, how do they punish you? How do they sanction you if you misbehave? They rob your Shabbat away from you. If you misbehave, you have to stay on base in Shabbat, which is by a very interesting sanction. It's called in Hebrew, Atamekabel Shabbat. And it doesn't mean you're getting the present, the gift of God. Matnata Shabbat, Atamekabel Shabbat. Yeah, you're sanctioned. You have to stay in the base on Shabbos. Now, it's interesting. The first Shabbos in the army in basic training is called, it's a beautiful concept in our Jewish army, it's called Shabbat Slichot. Which means no matter how much you misbehave, you get to go home on Shabbat. What the, what the commander tells you is you are supposed to stay on base because of what you did, but because it's Shabbat Slichot, the first Shabbat, you get to go home to your mother. And by the way, people get so homesick in the army. It's an interesting phenomenon. They get homesick. No matter how much they rebel against their parents, they, they love their mommy once they're back, once they're in the army. Really, really, the army is experience where you don't leave home, you actually come back home. You, and I remember the first, but now there's only one soldier ever heard of that managed to misbehave to such extent that in the first Shabbat in the army, there was no slicha for him. He had to stay in the army. And that soldier was myself. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm serious. It, it, this is, this is a, uh, actually, this is a troubling memory for me. We, uh, they gave us guns. And I was very curious about a certain button they had over here. And then, you know, boom. <laughs> Don't worry, no one was hurt besides my Shabbat. <laughs> I remember staying Shabbat, and I remember the interesting experience of staying Shabbat in August in the army is that everyone on the base goes to shul, and I realized why. It's a way to kill time. Two hours. So, for the so I'm noticing there there's people there in show that's their first time in show. Their first time in show. And they're there, and you know, the way they wear the kippot, the way they're holding the book, the way they're experiencing tefillah, it was the first time in show. And I got curious. So I started asking them questions. I was very curious. How does it feel when you are a virgin, when it comes to going to show? How does it feel? It's your first time. How does it feel? I was so curious. So I started asking them these questions. And Nebuch, they have to. Who is this guy asking them questions? So, and I remember I was so curious, and they say to me, Micha, Zaya Mishamim. <laughs> besides, he said, besides, are you Kamaktain? There's some parts in the Tfilah, and I won't forget this, that we felt like when they were saying that, that mysterious language, the part of Aramaic suddenly says, I felt like I was some shamanic tribe in South America. <laughs> that was spiritual. <laughs> Noticing the irony that the part in Aramaic were the tefillah, why? Because that's the only part that people used to understand. Now they're the islands that people don't understand. And what they don't understand is what pressed all the religious buttons in the souls of these people. And it got me thinking. This is what Umberto Eco is speaking about. Religiosity is triggered by a sense of mystery. If I don't understand it, it has meaning. This takes me. This was about the structure of Moren Ruhim to the content. Okay, so I'm moving on. Okay. The attempt to rationalize Judaism is also an attempt to sense on the existence of God. And this is the text we read, part one, uh, chapter one. The proof that you learn 
proof expressed by Aristotle and articulated by Ibn Sina. How does it work? Raman builds it the following way. This is the, this is the first chapter of Mishneh Torah. The first chapter of his attempt to unite higher. The first part of Mishneh Torah is called Ilchot Yesodei HaTorah. So we have a book called Mishneh Torah. And before he starts to, to build the entire building of the Torah, he has to set the foundations, the Yesodot of the Torah. And then before, how does he start? He lechot yesodei ha-Torah, saying, yesod ha-yesodot, be'amud ha-chokhmot, be'idah she'yesha matzui rishon, v'mamtzi kol imtza v'kol imtzaim, yishamayim v'mi'aretz u'ma she'beneem, lo yimatzu ela me'amitat yimatzu. Let's put this together. We have the Torah, shne Torah, founded on the yesodot, and all the yesodot are founded on yesod ha-yesodot. Meaning chapter one, is the foundation of the foundations of the Torah. Okay, that's the structure of Mishneh Torah. That's the importance of the opening statement. So this opening statement, the foundation of the foundations of the Torah, what's the content of that foundation? What's the content? What? That God exists. But what's the, he proves that God exists. And I hope you've managed to understand his ochacha, his proof. A little bit complicated um, because if you manage to understand it and you're persuaded by it, so now you believe in God. Rambam thought this is a hamuftit. Hamuftit meaning how you say this in English. What? No, not actually. Not. What? Yeah, demonstrative. Like two and two is four, right? Meaning. Mofit means, means that once it's the nature of the Muftit is like two and two is four. Is that once you understand that you lose your freedom of choice. Meaning once you realize that two and two is four, even if you want to believe it's five, you can't. You can't choose to believe anything beyond what was proven to you. It's imposed on your mind. That's how Descartes understands it. I think that's how my mind understands it. That's a Rukham Muftit, which means some sense, it's a mufit, it's a magic trick. You didn't believe in something. I'm a fit now to in that. It's imposed on you. Now, what's the content of it? God has to exist, but how, what, does, what does he prove? That God can't be Baal Guf. There can't be many gods. And how does he prove? Because the motion of the Galgalim, of the spheres, is in Sufi, is eternal. So we have, I imagine the following way, this is, comes from Aristotle, if there's infinite moving spheres. So infinite energy has to have a source. Now the source can't be possible to itself, the spheres themselves. Spheres, our language. Stars, they're limited, and the energy has no limits. Therefore, the source of the energy can't be from the universe. It has to be infinite. It's the, so the source of infinite energy has to be infinite itself. Therefore, something infinite exists. What's infinite can't be balgu, how do you say corporeal? Because anything corporeal has limits. And what's infinite can't be have diversity in it, because as he proved logically, anything that has diversity in it has limitations. Therefore, if it's infinite, it has, it has no diversity, it's one, and therefore, and it's also not corporeal. Therefore, God has to exist with no diversity as one and not corporeal. Oh, so that's God exists. The question is the obvious question asked many times in history. Is once you prove God exists when your mind, can't you just destroy religion? Because the God you discover with your mind is that a God you love in Mincha too? 
And the problem is that according to what Rambam says here, that the God, that's a God that's infinite and has no diversity, can't change. Why? This comes all the way back from Parmenides. That if something changes, change assumes diversity. Read this, it'll be easier to understand this. If I paint this chair, paint this table the blue. So there's diversity here, right? There was the not blue table and the blue table. Therefore, change means there's diversity. And if logically speaking, God can't be, there's not no diversity within divinity, therefore, God can change. God can change. If God can change, so praying loses its meaning. Because what is praying about? Asking God to do something he didn't plan to do. And actually, providence is impossible because providence is God reacting to my behavior. I did something good, I get something good. God is reacting to my behavior, therefore he's changing. So providence is impossible also. Prophecy is also changed, right? God didn't reveal himself to me. Now he's revealing himself to me. This point made by Aristotle also, according to the God of Perplex, is very simple. Um, in order for God to change, he has to express will to change. But will itself is a testimony of what? Will, if I want something, what does that say about me? I like it. And therefore, to speak about a perfect God that wants the paradox. Because if he wants, he's not perfect. God can't want. God can't need. God can change. The God we discover with our minds is a God that empties religion from its significance. And I want to think about the following paradox. By establishing that God. Hashgacha, nevuah, geula. Mitzvot, pilah, the foundations of Judaism. My question is the following. How is it that with the radical move that undermines all the foundations of Judaism, Rambam calls that move the foundation? How is it that the perfect God that you can't pray to, that can't reveal himself, that can't redeem you, the notion of God doesn't want anything. He's, he's perfect. Because Rambam bought into the Greek idea that only what's static is divine. Not dynamic. Not changing. That's a radical idea. But that idea has to lead to, that, to everything, all the foundations of Jewish tradition collapsing. That's what happened to Spinoza. You see God as something static. Rambam sees God as static, and he calls that move not as a move that challenges religion, but that's yesod ha-yesodot ba-amud ha-chokhmot. Here's how I've come to understand what Moray Nebuchim is about. As Hartman said once, and I quote, he said it to me once, Balpe, and I quote, he said, I won't imitate him. He said, God is the greatest threat on religion. There's nothing that threatens religion more than God. I think now we try to articulate philosophically why. Because there's a zero-sum game between God and religion. The greater God is, the less religion has any significance. If God is divine, transcendent, perfect, then prayers Providence, prophecy, lose their metaphysical meaning. Vice versa. If religion has meaning, if religion has significance, if I feel that my prayers work, if I feel that God is listening to me, if I feel that God is watching me, if religion has significance, so God seems less perfect, less transcendent. But if I would say the problem is, how can, you, how can religion have significance and God stay perfect? The same. There's a zero-sum game between God and religion. And sometimes, in order to empower religion, 
we have to minimize God, but if we want to glorify God, we have to minimize the true metaphysical significance of religion. And that zero-sum game, that zero-sum game is the true perplexity of what the guide for the perplexity. That's what the Mevucha is. I think it's not, as maybe Hartman or Daniel will say, tension between not Gauss put it, tension between Jerusalem and Antichrist. I think it's a tension between God and religion. And if God is truly if he's beyond praise, if he's beyond language, he's not only greater than language, he's, great, he's bigger than religion. We can't mock him. Religion. I know that in Israel, over 60% of secular Israelis believe in God. And I think their intuition is the following. You ask them, what is it? God and you're secular? You don't practice religion? I think their unspoken intuition of some of them following, I think what they mean is because I believe in God. It's because I believe in the greatness of God. I think the spirit of time he this. Religion creates a small God. Actually, let's put it. If you believe that what God cares about is punishing you for not wearing hot something, and he punishes you for not having your head cut, that's what God does. You're imagining an imperfect God, changing, small God, actually by definition God. God by definition, as Descartes puts it, I think this is, this is Rambam's definition as absolute perfect. So, which means God, punishing God is an oxymoron. And punishing God is not a God, because if he punishes, changes, not a God. Which means that religion is a very interesting form of heresy. But I got in trouble for saying this. I was interviewed in Israeli TV, and my book came out, and Maimonides, and I spoke for 24 minutes, and I said, I had one line there. I said, that is the greatest part of the Kfira. Obviously, they have to do promos for the TV show. So promos for the TV show, they took that one line, and you'll see me in Israel saying again and again that religion is heresy. <laughs> that religion is heresy. And I can't tell you how many people, how many people, <laughs> that's the only thing they know that I ever said in my life. <laughs> yeah. Why did you say that religion is heresy? I, and I make a frame, it happened to me. Walk with me once down Emmerich and you'll see that happening to me. That's a problem with promos for TV. But actually, I think for Rambam, this is very serious. And I think this is the Mevucha, not between Athens, but the philosophers discovered and Jerusalem, the prophets discovered. That wasn't the problem that created the pain that gave birth to this book. The problem is how do you reconcile not Jerusalem and Athens, not different bodies? How do, you recon how do you reconcile your God and your religion? And I think that's what Moreh Nebuchim is about, and what Moreh Nebuchim does, as opposed, I think, in a deep way, in the Middle Ages, try to deal with this problem. In the Kabbalistic tradition, they deal with this through reinterpreting God. Sfirot, in order to make this possible without giving up the perfection of God. Maimonides does this, not by reinterpreting God, but by reinterpreting religion, reinterpreting what mitzvot do. They have an impact on God. They change the person who performs the mitzvot. What is prophecy? It's not an action of God, but a human achievement. What is providence? What is redemption? And so forth and so on. By reinterpreting the foundations of the Torah, he's establishing his God as the foundation of those foundations. In that sense, that, I think, is the tension that the God is trying to solve. Which takes me to the third part of our conversation today, 
What's the tension that he's actually trying to create? By the way, so ask, how does he solve this tension between God and religion? How? By my book. <laughs> it's only in Hebrew, though. Things translate. I think you should buy them my book for all your congregation also. It's also. I think that's a good idea. No, I think how does he the question is how does he take all these foundations? Providence, prophecy, mitzvot, redemption, and how does he reinterpret in a way where those foundations will still be alive at the same time, won't undermine the perfection of God? That's his big problem. And as, as a result, if that's your tension, the, the guide resolves that tension. I think the book that resolves that tension. Chapter one. Chapter one. Great revelation. The attempt to explain the problem of robbing Torah from its This is how it does. Christ saved us from the temptation, what Rambam called the sickness, but irrationality by offering a new explanation of what rationality. And I think this is, when he writes that there's a disease, you don't understand. And it's, it's a result of very, a very, of a very low self esteem of our own intellect. Something has to be, if I don't understand it, it has me. I remember. Five years ago, I did this. And I realized in the middle of a class, my course until this day, in the middle of my class, I don't really know what I'm talking about. Now, this probably happened to some of you. But I realized I actually don't know as a class, I actually don't know what I'm talking about. And the class, so what do you do now? So you start hiding behind language. This is where you start using very vague language, very unclear. No one can catch you. By the way, what lectures usually do when they really don't understand anything, they say the word dialectic many times. It's dialectic. There's a dialectic tension there. And I was saying dialectic, and I was going through the class, and it was painful. I just, and those, well, maybe some of you have been there before. You just want the class to end. And finally, it ends. Finally, I say, okay. Going to my car. They want to look at my students. Go to my car. One student walking after me. So I walk quicker. And he's coming right at me. I just don't want to confront him. What am I going to say? <laughs> so here's the big question now. What will come first, my car or the student? So I walk all the way to my car. I walk to my car and he my face. He says to me, Dr. Gutman, and I will tell you a little bit about He says to me, Dr. Goodman, Apam Zaya Mok. Apam Zaya Mok. And all the way back to Jerusalem, I'm driving, I'm saying, I finally know how to do deep lessons. <laughs> if you speak in a way that no one understands, including yourself. something very important I learned from David. That what's very deep is actually to be clear. The intuition, if you don't understand something, but you're deep. By the way, there's some people that even write in a deep fashion. There are deep books. And I'm trying to understand, why is it, why was that a deep lesson? Is if no one understands what you're speaking about. What David always taught me is that only if you want to 
clarity. But may, but this is a vision. Can't Where does this come from? This comes from why do we? Think, if I don't understand something, it's tapping into my Shabbat in the base, right? I can't understand it. It's mysterious. It's sacred. If I can't get it, then it's deep and profound. Where does that come from? It comes from according to the analysis of Maimonides that we have a very low self-esteem, but we our understanding, our intellect is not valued by us. Therefore, if I can understand something, what's the big deal about that thing? If I can understand it. Playing on Groucho Marx's famous joke that if, as I go, if a club will accept me, that's not a club I want to belong to. Why would I belong to a club that accepts me? It's the, now, the paraphrase that if I can understand, if I can understand something, what does that mean about that thing? I want to involve things I can't understand. Now, this undermining of our intellect is what leads to an undermining of, rationali- of rationality. What Rambam does in chapter 1 is upgrading of our intellect. He says our intellect is Elohim. It's Tselem Elohim. And by upgrading the image of our intellect, he's trying to say, it's not if you don't understand it, it has meaning, but only if you understand it, it has meaning. Now, how does he do this move? We're running out of time. But how does he do this move? It's a triple move. Move number one, he's saying, that in biblical Hebrew, the word selim means what Aristotle calls the essence of things. What's the essence? According to Aristotle, a quick shi'u in Aristotle philosophy. What is essence? What's the essence? The essence as opposed to the essence, um, a characteristic of something, as opposed to the accidental characteristic of something. I want to use the example the famous example, the most important example for teachers of philosophy around the world, the chair. How great imagination. is accidental. In fact, I could sit, sit in it. Well, more. that's the essence of the chair. The essence is what makes something that thing. As a result of this Aristotelian observation, now we can ask an ethical question. What does it mean to be good? Well, in order to ask the ethical question, we have to ask the ontological question, meaning only if we know what the essence of something, we could ask what it means to be good in that thing. For example, what's a good knife? What's the, not that it's red or green. So if it cuts good, well, if it's a good knife. Let's take us to an ethical paradox. What is a good thief? <laughs> a thief that gifts Doka. Is he a good thief? Is he a good thief? No. If a thief, what's a good thief? It's a person that does the art. It's called being a thief. He does that very well. That's a good thief. Masters that art. He's good. If he gets caught, he's not a good thief. Now let's ask finally, what is a good human being? We have to ask what a good human being is. We first have to ask, according to Aristotle, what does it mean to be human? What's the essence of humanity? Then, we, then we'll ask, how do you do that? That that makes you human, good. According to Aristotle, there's two answers going in ethics, but one of them. What makes you, what? Our intellect. Ties to intellect. Going to that, it's our intellect. Meaning, what's a good person? Not a person who gives stuff. What's a good person? A person who does that that makes you a human being. Best, meaning what's the good person? Who's the best at that? Aristotle. <laughs> Philosopher, that's right. Okay, that's now Aristotle. What does Rambam do in the opening of the guide? 
He said what Aristotle calls the essence is in the Bible called Selim. It's just a translation. It's a dictionary, the, the opening of the God of the Perplex. He's investigating biblical Hebrew. And he's saying that Selim means what Aristotle calls essence. What in contemporary Hebrew be called Surah. But there is another move in the Bible. Because the Bible doesn't say Tselim. What does it say? Tselim Elohim. This is a triple move. Seeing the essence as Tselim and Tselim. And that triple move leads to the following conclusion. That, that that makes us human is what makes us divine. It's the human part within us that's divine. Our Selim, the essence of our humanity, that's Elohim. Meaning, according, this is the opening declaration of, of Moren Evochim. The more human I am, the more divine I am. The religiosity is not about escaping my humanity, the classic religious impulse. It's about elevating my humanity. And my humanity is my intellect, which means. Let's say, as opposed to the classic religious impulse, as I explained it through echo, if I don't understand something, it has religious meaning. The Italianus expresses it the following way. Yeah, the church father, Verdo qui absurdum est. I believe because I can't, absurd, it's absurd. Only if I can't understand it, then faith is born. It's going beyond our intellect. Beyond what makes us human. Religion is where I escape my intellect, escape my humanity. This revol the revolution of Maimonides. As he says that what Aristotle calls essence is what we call Selim, but Selim is a, that triple move, means that my intellect is not something I have to overcome in order to get close to God. I have to elevate my intellect. I have to expand my intellect in order to get close to God. If classic impulse that he says this is a disease in people's soul, understand has no meaning. That's that's a result of the fact that we don't understand the meaning of understanding. But the revolution of understanding uh, understanding is divine. Therefore, only if I understand something, then that thing has meaning. The first move of the guide is upgrading the self-esteem of our intellect by seeing and not saying that I have to overcome in order to enter. The world, God's world. But I have to expand that. That's the opening statement, creating the foundation of his rationalism. Which takes me to a bigger problem. How do you get close to God? You can go to God through training your intellect. And you train your intellect through understanding the world. And now this is how it goes. There's a hierarchy of being in the world. And the higher the being is the more I am religiously rewarded for understanding it. I get closer to God. We have the world very quickly of Alba Yisodot. I master the world of Alba Yisodot of the four elements. So I get close to God. That close. Because this is a very shallow world. But above this world, we have the world of the Galgali. That's harder to understand. It gets, but if I understand, it gets much closer. And if I understand the Galgalim, I also understand that beyond the Galgalim, we have what they call the separate intellects. Above the separate intellects, we have God. So my way to God is trying to understand more and more of this world. Stars and the separate intellects. Let me say one thing about that. You know how, and did you try to understand part 2, chapter 24? Did you understand? Let me try to explain the problem here. You know, at nighttime, you look at the stars, you see those. Let's try to imagine. We don't know what we see. We see um, white dots in a dark sky, right? So, what do we imagine exists between those white dots? Now, we're very modern here. What exists there? Space. There's a 
only one problem. Space, what is the definition of space? What's the definition of space? Right? There's a gap. What, what exists in space? What exists? I think if we could see two stars in between them, we don't see anything. So what exists between them? Oh, no, I, I don't want to do now modern physics. I don't know modern physics. I only know, you know I'm in the 12th century. Something, let's try, let's try to, do, the, the knowledge we have is from what we see. If I can't see anything between two stars, they have space, or there's only problem about space. The definition of space is what? Nothing. So we have to assume the following, that nothing exists. There's only one problem. What's nothing? Saying that nothing exists is saying that nothing is something, but saying that nothing is something is obviously, it's false. It's a paradox. Logically, it can't be that nothing exists, that space exists. Saying that space exists is a paradox. Therefore, something has to exist between stars. That something, the ages, they believe, filled the space with a fifth element. And the fifth element had to be matter, but it also had to be invisible, like glass. See-through, you can't see it. So the best way to think about the sky, you look at the sky at night and you see the stars, and between them you have a lot of matter. It's all the fifth divine element. It's like glass. Now let's say, now, uh, if you deny the existence of the fifth element, it's because you are listening to your eyes and not to what? Your intellect. We have to have our logic overcome our vision. That's the challenge of science. Okay. Now, how does, how does the world, how does the, I'll tell you how the world is really built. It goes like this. The star, as you see, Venus, Mars, the moon, it's stuck on a larger, what they call middle age, galgal, or the Greeks call a sphere. What's a galgal? The galgal itself is made from the fifth element, therefore you can't see it. The galgal is evolving. Meaning, the star that you see, that's not in movement. What's in movement? The Galgal that's on it. But we can't see the movement of the Galgal. We can only see the movement of the star. You with me? Good. So we're now in advanced studies of middle age astrophysics. It's not a Galgal. Galgal is actually, in Hebrew, it's, it's, it's not, it's, it's like a... Um, touching each other and revolving. We have one sphere of, of moon and evolving, evolving around that, the sphere of Mars, and above that, Venus, and so forth and so forth, held a big sphere that has many, many stars on it called Kuchavim Mazalot. That's the structure of the world. Okay? Meaning, you go on a spaceship, you go to the sky, what will happen eventually to a spaceship? It will crash in the fifth element. There's no space there. It's only matter, and it's, it's all filled with this element. There's only one problem with that description. Reconcile what this. Just trying to create very sophisticated and complicated astrophysics. All this was resolved by Copernicus many years later. It was a big, but Rambam that the physics of the he didn't have the answer that modern physics will bring to this world, but he realizes the crisis 
of the science of his world. Now he introduces in part two and three in Mishnah Torah the classic party line of how the structure of the universe, how, how it works. But in part two, 34, he criticizes that picture, that classic structure of the universe. And what happens to the reader that went through all of part one of the, of the guide, most of part two, now up to chapter, part two, chapter 24, and you reach the end of chapter 24. What just happened to you? What happened to the reader? This is Larry Strauss's question. Don't ask what the text say. Try to ask what does the text do to its reader? What happens to you? Now let's try to think what happens. The entire book, his entire life, he's advocating. In order to know God, you have to know the stars. In order to know God, you have to know astrophysics. But then in 24, he's saying, there's only one problem. You can't understand astrophysics. It's unintelligible. I want to read the end of part two, chapter 24, because I think it's a very dramatic ending, I believe creating an earthquake in the theological structure of the God of the Papa. Chapter 24. That was given to me. I'd like to read this. I know it's in Arabic. I want to read this in Hebrew because I love Michael Schwartz's translation for the guide in general. I think it's the best translation until now. But especially especially was sensitive to the meaning of this part. I want to read the end, the very end. The very end. The last paragraph of 224. You have it in, in Hebrew? You have this? I'm going to do this quickly and skip. What's our condition? Only God knows. Structure always was. No the sky, no God. Now we still count. God knows the sky. You can't know the sky. As a result, you can't know God. Now, with that, I want to skip. Since the crisis, how much? There's a mystery. We can't know anything about the stars, about the Galgalim. I think this is cynical. Maybe someone else knows. Maybe someone else knows how to explain what I can't explain. I prefer the truth. This is the writer of Say I just shared he confessed his mevu. But you know his mevu. Not about anything, but about the core. That will lead tells you. Maybe we can't ever know this. We can't ever know science. Build an part of nature. Part in the Bam's Mevu. 
Any other questions? Even I try to intervene, God intervenes. But the real unsolvable tension of life how is it that the Rambam, more than any other philosopher, philosopher in Jesus, located, learning, studying, nature, stars, in the center of our religion? Knowing God, but not learning nature, heart of his theology. And more than anyone else, he's pushing his students and his readers to learn, to obtain knowledge about nature. God. But this, this is the same Rambam that more than any other thinker in our tradition believe that you can. That knowledge, Domo Penis says, and in this sense, the ser of Immanuel Kant, that our understanding has boundaries. And verse 24 is a critique of our understanding. The same thinker that pushes us to understand also realizes that you can't understand. What is Rambam doing to us? What is he doing to his readers? Is this the myth of Sisyphus sending us to do something that he knows we're failed, we will fail? Sending us to achieve something knowing that it will be impossible to achieve? Is this the myth? Sisyphus? You'd expect a person that thinks it's impossible to understand to introduce a different, a different set of ethics. Our purpose in life is not to understand, but to experience something else. Rabbi Nachman, something else. Or you'd expect someone that thinks that the purpose of Judaism is to understand, to believe it's possible to understand. Like Rabbi Sa'ad Yagaron, their intellect doesn't have any boundaries. The conflict between his epistemology, understanding we have boundaries of our understanding, and his ethics, the purpose of living is understanding. That tension, I think, is the tension of Moren In that sense, Moren wasn't written in order to solve this Mevucha. It was written what did he achieve with this Mevucha, with this tension? Window into the world. Paradox. The God of the Complex, I think we will find Dafka and Mishneh Torah. I'd like to read chapter 2. The mitzvah, to love God, fear God, creates the obvious question. The fact that you're commanded to love God, what's the obvious question? It's a weird mitzvah. As if it's too bad to love God, that assumes that that emotion is something that we can control. As Voltaire wrote once, there are certain emotions that we have that are like beyond our control. Like Shri um, uh, the muscle, like, like we have muscles that we can control through it. Like I could just move my. my Want to move. I can't want to not a beat slower, a little beat slower. It's beyond my control. Practice yoga. But you can get in shape, and as a result, your heart will be a set of actions that would lead my heart to be. I think that's what Rambam is asking. He's asking to say, what do I have to do? Give birth. Great emotion. Uh, 
היררכיה What leads to the love of God? Part three as golden. The more you learn nature, the more you understand nature, the more the love of God grows. What is the love of God? That feeling that you have physics lesson, or observing the stars at night, that feeling of choosing my words carefully, of amazement, of radical amazement, that feeling that you have standing in front of nature, that sense of amazement, that feeling doesn't lead to the love of God. That's the love of God. That feeling is the love of God. But that emotion comes in a package always simultaneously with another emotion. Which emotion? What's the emotional emotion? Sense of sense of well, moments. Feeling of tininess doesn't lead to yira. That's yira. Hey, according to my monies, fearing God is not fearing his punishment. Not fearing that maybe I'll be burnt sometime, somewhere, in a very warm place. There's a charismatic machzir b'tshuva in Israel that says to a large crowd, "Kore begeno." It's not the fear of punishment that's Yirat Hashem. It's the sense of that you experience instead of nature when you're in front of nature. We're talking about a burst of what gives birth to these learning. Notice that for some reason, always said as a result of very modern attempt to categorize human behavior. French, this is the following category. You try to categorize as certain people that are aggressive. Right? If you're rational, that probably means that you are not in to your emotions, and vice versa. Emotional people are not their emotional world is not somehow disturbed by the rationality that attempts to separate. Nachman writes in a certain place that you can actually tell when you meet a person that learns a lot of morality. If a person is dry and very pale, then he's reading a lot of morality. That's buying in the categories Rational, you're not emotion. Those very childish categories. I think what Rampam is saying here that you can't separate the categories because this this very passionate experience is not divorced from his. In
intellectual achievement. It's a result of his intellectual achievements. Point to Rambam, the more you achieve intellectually, the more religiously emotional you get. Avavira is what your intellect gives birth to. Radical amazement and this. I like to read this. Right? <laughs> What kind of a thing? God's wisdom. Good things, which I understand. Boundaries. What are the boundaries? Boundaries of what? I can understand it. Just trapped in the boundaries of my intellect. If I realize that there's beyond limits. What kind of an understanding? Beyond limits. What kind of a limited understanding? They died to Shema Gadol. What kind of understanding doesn't satisfy your thirst for knowledge, but creates it? But it creates a thirst for knowledge. And finally, the type of time we talk about here is not the time. Physically speaking. But he's not speaking about physical tininess here. That's not what he's talking about. He's saying, what tininess is he speaking about here? Intellectual tininess. Question, what kind of understanding makes you understand that there's no limit? What kind of understanding gives birth to a thirst to understand? What kind of understanding leads to of intellectual what kind of understanding is Rambam? I think he's trying to promote here is understanding that you can understanding that you can. It's my understanding that Rambam wasn't might have been Aristotelian, but not Aristotelian. The Jew, but there's something very strong saying. The Maimonidian. That the best understanding, what gives birth to our Vavi, understand. Sense of power. Accepting your lack of control. Paradox of Mary. Not the mysticism. Of not sending you to a hell understanding. And you're trying to understand God, you can't reach God, but you hit boundaries of intellect, hitting, recognizing boundaries of humanity, trying to love. 
make sense of a big part of rum. Example rum here. Astrology, as much as we describe different uh, any of um, seeing God as human. Imagine God as human. God is like imagining the entire world of God as we have to accept the lack of humanity of God, I have to accept the fact the boundaries of my own true mystery out there and the true ultimate otherness. Also, the stars are not human, they're not alive, they're not observing me. I've been understood that um that that um um astrology founding science in the Middle Ages is also a different form of egocentric, egocentric, whatever that is. But your ego is in the center of your world view, and that's because there's a very strong connection between egelomania and paranoia. You know the definition of being paranoid is? You're in a football state. And you think they're talking about you? Now, is that negative? Is that positive? What is that? The world is about me. Astro- astrology. What is astrology about? What the star is doing now? They're about me? Venus, Mars, the moon. It's all somehow about me, dealing with me. Roman thought that his theology is therapeutic in the sense that I realize that God is not about me. Denying Ashgaha Pratit is a part of our therapy. The stars are not about me. The world is not about me. Failing to understand is also recognizing the boundaries of my humanity, realizing that there's a world out there. God, stars, and me, understanding how not central we are to the world, is the part I think of the Rambam. It's not the myth of Sisyphus because, and this is why I think these thoughts of Maimonides are so important. Because this is a form of skepticism. In a postmodern world, our lack of objective world leads many times to cynicism and despair. Maimonides trying to leverage those boundaries and recognizing the world. Not the cynicism, not the cynicism. But to Ahava Bira. In that sense, I think Maimonides has what to say to the Nevochim, the 21st century. Oh, in Mishnah Torah. Yeah, yeah. One in part one, part one, chapter fifty nine. The other one, some if I one. Okay, so between one, Aleph Nun Tes, Aleph, some if Aleph, different God. One God, one God, that's quoted there in Mishnah. One. Old. 
that chapter is called Rambam. God not separate from Israel. Read it through. And then in Aleph Nun Tet, he says God is still separate from Israel. Things inside the world, not letting us know that God, but God in the same category of the world. That's two God. I think complexity is created between gods is a part of the move creating sense. Bam bam, not as a person. Therapy of love. Part one, chapter one, guide, interpret, control, might be a key. I gave you a chance. Yeah. Oh, let me speak in Hebrew. Bet kaf dalet. Bet kaf dalet, sorry. Yeah, and Aleph nun dalet and bet kaf dalet. Thank you. I elect. How is this Jewish? This is not the end. More of them. Trigger it. Um, in that sense, if you're Daniel, look at me tomorrow. Bam, bam. You didn't have a philanthropy organized. It's philanthropy. I understand. Bam, bam. Done a lot together. Last week, but the attention growth. Maybe did an inner 
attention. God. Placing achievement with a thing. This is. Top of my mind. I'm serious. 175 rabbis were there. Knowing what you're dealing with. Hard. Hopeless. Arabah. <laughs>